right, thanks so much, everyone, for taking the time to be here this evening. I want to thank John and the whole Liberty on the Rocks uh, meetup group for uh, uh, pr providing the opportunity for me to speak here tonight to everyone. And, uh, you know, when I was talking to John uh, a couple months back about a possible topic to present here at Liberty on the Rocks, uh, I felt there was no better topic than uh, gun ownership rights and the Second Amendment in general. Uh, and kind of came to my attention that many people still don't really deeply understand the original intent uh, of the Second Amendment as was put forward uh, in the founding documents of America. So I figured I would do sort of a, um, a, a breakdown, uh, an, an in-depth analysis of the Second Amendment. And that led to this presentation that I'm going to give here this evening, which is entitled true meaning and purpose of the Second Amendment. And this is going to fly in the face of, you know, the type of uh, modern day revisionism that is often attempted to be put forward about what the Second Amendment really meant. So I'm going to jump right in. I call this 27 words worth fighting for, this little introduction. And it's just really the 27 words of the Second Amendment. And they are indeed words that are worth fighting for if we truly understand what they mean. So Amendment 2 of the Bill of Rights a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This was written by George Mason and James Madison, and it was ratified into the Bill of Rights on December 15, 1791. 27 simple words. Uh, again, many people want to try to revise this to suit their agenda and to suit their interpretations. What I'm going to try to do here is to provide people with a framework for understanding of what the actual men who wrote this meant by it. So we're going to be doing, I'm going to be giving this presentation in two sections, field stripping and reassembly. And for those who aren't quite gun savvy, field stripping doesn't mean we're going to be going into a field and getting naked, okay? It means field stripping in firearms parlance refers to breaking down the firearm to its constituent components and then you know you would clean it or try to maintain its operation and then you're going to put it back together that's called reassembly so we're going to break down the second amendment we're going to perform an, an uh, you know a, a complete analysis on every word in the second amendment so let's start with this phrase a well regulated militia this is probably the most important part of the second amendment and yet it gets truncated all the time and people just go to right to the phrase the right to bear arms shall not be infringed okay so this is the most important part of the entire second amendment and most people don't understand what this means so let's look at what both of these terms actually mean what does well regulated really mean what did the founders what did the writers the authors of the second amendment really mean by the term well regulated okay so I'm going to define simple everyday words here, give dictionary definitions, and then explain what it really meant. To regulate means to maintain according to a set of standards so that something operates or functions properly, such as with a machine or a process. That's what it means to regulate something. The term well-regulated, as put forward by the authors of the Second Amendment, did not mean, it had nothing to do with quote-unquote government regulation. This is what modern revisionists want to say well-regulated militia had to do with. Government controlled, government regulated. It absolutely did not mean that. It literally referred to the regularization and maintenance of the equipment being used and proper training for tactics that were being employed by the militia, which we'll get to what that means. But this would be a well-regulated rack of shotguns. They're all the same. They all shoot the same ammunition. They're all well-kept. They're all in good working operation, in good working order. Okay? And those who would be trained on the usage of those shotguns, well-regulated would be part of their training. Do you know the components? Do you know how to clean it? Do you know how it works? Do you know its effective range? Do you know tactics with it? Okay? That's what well-regulated meant according to the, the authors of the Second Amendment. It had nothing to do with government involvement. And anybody that tells you that it, it did is e either ignorant or lying to you. Okay, so now the most important part of this entire presentation is to understand what was meant by the word militia, capitalized M, in the Second Amendment. 
So what is the militia? The English word militia is actually derived from the Latin term militium vulgarum. It's a truncation of that term. And in Latin, militium vulgarum literally means like the military everywhere. Militium means like the military, similar to military. And then vulgarum means the commonplace, everywhere present. Okay, So it meant literally, like the military everywhere, or in other words, capability that is commensurate to a military force which is present everywhere or distributed throughout an entire population. That's what the word militia actually means. A militia is a decentralized, distributed force of armed individuals who maintain weapons and tactics similar to a military force but unlike a standing military, are not centrally controlled or directed by a government. The militia is not the military. The militia is not a standing army. A militia is not a military or a standing army that is controlled by a government. Okay, so that's what a militia actually is. Then the question becomes, who then comprises the militia? Who is this militia that is talked about in the Second Amendment? When asked the question, who constitutes the militia, the authors of the Second Amendment and many other American founders and patriots were consistently clear and unambiguous in their speech and writings about who constituted the militia. The militia spoken of in the Second Amendment is comprised of the entire body of the people who are capable of employing arms for the purpose of repelling, repelling an organized uh, foreign or domestic threat to their lives or freedom. That is who the militia is. That is who the, constitutes the militia. It is the entire body of citizens, the entire body of people that are capable of taking up arms for the purpose of repel, repelling an organized threat or invasion. So you are the militia, whether you knew that or not tonight. Okay? We are the militia. There is no separating the people and the militia. They are one and the same. And the founders and other patriots con consistently referred to the people as the militia. The, the, author, the co-author of the Second Amendment, along with James Madison, George Mason, when asked the question many times during the course of his life and in his writings, what he, he said, what is the militia? It is the whole people. Period. That's who the militia is. And that, that's the person who wrote the Second Amendment telling you that, not me. Okay? So let's hear from some other people who talked about who the militia was. James Madison, the other co-author of the Second Amendment, said a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the best and most natural defense of a free country. He's telling you who constitutes the militia. The body of the people. That, who the, that is who the militia is. Richard Henry Lee, a Virginia delegate to the Second Continental Congress, and actually the delegate who tabled the motion for American independence, said, a militia, when properly formed, are in fact the people themselves and include all men capable of bearing arms. I would include women in that as well. In, in the parlance of their times, of course, they would have never even considered women as, you know, members of the militia because only men went to, went to any kind, type of conflict or battle. But I would say it includes all people capable of bearing arms. Tenge Cox, a Pennsylvania delegate to the First Continental Congress, said, who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Congress shall have no power to disarm the militia. <laughs> Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God it will ever remain in the hands of the people. So, that's what a militia is, that's who the militia is. Unambiguously, by the men themselves who authored the Second Amendment, so let's break down this phrase, and we'll do it one word at a time. Being necessary to the security of a free state. 
These terms have to be broken down individually. What did they mean by necessary? Necessary for what? Security. What did they mean? Security from what? And what do they mean by a free state? So let's look at this. The word necessary, dictionary definition, required to be done, achieved or present, needed, essential, something that you cannot dispense with, that must be there. Okay, the word necessary appears in the entire Constitution of the United States only six times. And in the Bill of Rights, it appears only one time. And the only place where the word necessary was used in the Constitution and Bill of Rights to refer to a thing, group, or entity is in the Second Amendment. The only thing which the authors of the Constitution and Bill of Rights enshrined as necessary was the militia. It is the only thing to which the word necessary comes right before, that, that, that it was necessary to securing a free way of life, as, as we will see. Not even the three branches of government, the president or the executive, the Congress or the legislative, and the Supreme Court, the, judici the judiciary, are referred to in the Constitution using the word necessary. The question then necessarily becomes, pun intended, to what ultimate purpose did the writers of these documents understand that the militia was necessary? Why was it necessary? It was necessary as a means for security, which is stated in the Second Amendment, but a security against what? That's the most important thing to understand, why the founders wanted a strong militia. The word security, dictionary definition, the state of being free from danger or threat. To secure something means to protect it against threats. Thomas Jefferson, founding father, you know, person who basically wrote the Declaration of Independence, the third president of the United States said, for a people who are free and who mean to remain so, a well-organized and armed militia is their best security. Right there in Thomas Jefferson's own words. So what was meant by a free state? They said that it's necessary to the security meaning keeping it from threats of a free state. The word free state did not mean Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, as, we'll, as we will get to. The word free, dictionary definition, it means not under the control or the domination of another. Not under the control or domination of another. Or in other words, not a slave. Not a subject to someone else. The word state, dictionary definition, the particular con condition that someone or something is in at a specific time. Very simple definitions of words. Okay? This is exactly what they meant. They didn't mean, it did not refer, the phrase free state did not refer to a geographic region such as Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, etc. It referred to a free condition of existence or a free way of life, a free state of being. That is what they referred to in the Second Amendment. Now, what was the threat to that free way of being? And the founders were all too happy to tell us what that threat was. The threat that they envisioned as the thing that was the most dangerous thing to a free way of existence were standing armies. Standing armies constituted by government. And they told us repeatedly this. George Mason, the co-author of the Second Amendment, said once a standing army is established in any country, the people lose their liberty. Recollect the history of most nations of the world. What havoc, desolation, and destruction have been perpetrated by standing armies. You know, in the Constitution, a standing army against a foreign power threat was only supposed to be brought together for a period of two years, and then all funding was to be withdrawn from it. You know, but we don't go by that anymore. You know, we've thrown that out the window because we didn't listen to the words of these wise people that were telling us that the biggest threat to domestic freedom was standing armies. And I would suggest there's a different form of a standing army that lives among us in the modern world, and we're going to get to what that is. Elbridge Gary, fifth vice president of the United States, said, what is the use of a militia? of a militia. It is to prevent the establishment of a standing army, the bane of liberty. 
Whenever governments mean to invade the rights and liberties of the people, they always attempt to destroy the militia in order to raise an army upon their ruins. I'm going to explain what a militia is and how it protects against a standing army with a simple infographic here. Okay? If you envision a geographic region like the United States, the mainland United States like this, imagine a standing army being raised or even several standing armies being raised in the midst of the people so that they were going to attempt to take their freedom. Let's look at this as even a foreign invading power for the time being. Okay, so let's say three standing armies invade the United States and take up these positions as their, their, their main positions. So those red dots are rep represent a standing army. This, what I'm, the next thing I'm going to show you is what would represent the militias of the people constituted and being present within the borders of the United States. This is what pro properly constituted militias would look like. Now, what are standing armies going to do against that force of distributed military power present in the hands of the people? That's what I mean by distributed force. They could take out any of those standing armies essentially by swarming them. Okay, that's what the founders originally intended to mean the security of a free way of life in the United States by having the entire body of the people well armed and well trained with those arms. This is the standing army the founders were warning us about. We have standing armies in almost every major city. They're called militarized police forces. Now that has taken over, you know, the traditional idea of the standing army. It has taken over, certainly, the traditional idea of the militia. We have the National Guard that has replaced the kind of idea of the militia was not meant to be under any kind of a governmental institution. Certainly not a militarized police force, which is what we have in just about every single city within the United States, let alone every state. Okay? There's the standing army we were warned against repeatedly. The militia was seen as absolutely essential, required, and necessary to secure a free way of life. Richard Henry Lee, again, the, the delegate who actually tabled the notion for the Declaration of Independence, said to preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. You were ingraining in the children not only the, the uh, ability to use arms, but you were ingraining in them a deep respect for them, as we're going to talk about. A responsibility, you know, for what it meant to be, to own, to possess, and to be trained in the use of firearms. Alexander Hamilton, another founding father, said, if circumstances should at any time oblige the government to form an army of any magnitude, that army can never be formidable to the liberties of the people, while there is a large body of citizens, little if at all inferior to them in discipline and use of arms, who stand ready to defend their rights. He was describing the militia. That was the militia. The body of people who were not inferior to a military force in, the, in their discipline, their tactics, and their use of arms. Okay, he said, as long as there's that kind of a body of people, well trained like that, who stand ready to defend their rights, no military is going to be formidable to their liberties. No military is going to be able to take their liberties. And like a standing army, let's say, that constitutes, that is constituted by a militarized police force might. Let's go into the next phrase in the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms. So we have to break down several words in this. We have to break down right. We have to understand what keep means. We have to understand what to bear means. And we have to understand what the word arms means. You know, the people is pretty self-explanatory. That's all of us. What are arms? Simple dictionary definition. Weapons and ammunition of any kind. 
I challenge anybody, go look it up in a good dictionary. There's the definition you're going to get. It does not mean just guns, just firearms. It means anything that you are capable of picking up and using as a piece of defensive weaponry. A hammer is arms, okay? A club is arms. A knife is arms. A bow and arrow. A handgun or a semi-automatic rifle. Okay, they're all arms. It's what can you use in a defensive capacity when you are being accosted with violence against your life, your freedom, or your property. That's what arms are. Very simple. Now, this next section gets into my work specifically a little bit because to understand what a right is, what it was meant by a right by the founders, you want to look into my material on natural law or what is simply moral law, spiritual law. I highly recommend people check out my full seminar called Natural Law, The Real Law of Attraction and How to Apply It in Your Life. If you are not familiar with it, if you have not already seen it, I highly suggest that I think it is the most important work that I put forward. So this comes from some of my Natural Law seminars, and it's a simple chart of the difference between right and wrong. You know, it seems strange to even have to put something like this up and talk about that, but the sad fact of the matter is most people cannot give you the definition of what a right is. The vast body of people cannot tell you what a right is, and that's why we're losing our rights. Okay? So right and wrong have a basis in truth or untruth. Okay? Right is based in truth. That's why we use the same word when we say right and when we say correct. You know, to mean morally right, we use the word right, and to mean correct, yes, you got the correct answer, that's the right answer. There's, not, there, there's no coincidence with why those words are the same, because Rightness in the sense of morality is also based in truth. Okay, when, when you are correct and you're, something is based in truth, more likely than not, it is going to be also based in morality. So it is moral. What is right is what is moral. It is in harmony with the laws of nature, the moral laws of nature. And it's in harmony with those laws because actions that are based in right do not result in harm to other sentient beings. Wrong, on the other hand, is based in untruth. It is based in illusion. Okay? It is immoral because it is in opposition to natural law and actions that are based in it result in harm to other sentient beings. So a right can really only be defined in the negative. You have to use negative phraseology when you're defining what a right is. Okay? A right is an action that does not cause harm to another sentient being. That is the actual definition of a right and I would suggest 99.99% percent of people cannot give that correct definition, sadly. That what was, is what was meant by a right, meaning I own a firearm, I'm not causing harm with it, it is my possession, I own it, I'm responsible for it. There is a correct usage of it, there is a moral usage of it, and then there is an incorrect or immoral usage of it. So you have a right to keep and bear arms for self-defensive purposes, which is what this next part is about. It's about understanding the difference between force and violence. Violence is always wrong. You're always violating somebody else's rights when you conduct violence. Self-defensive force, however, is always a right that you reserve, naturally and inherently. In my natural law seminar, I break down that true spirituality, true enlightenment, is actually based upon two basic pillars or tenets or principles. And one is the sacred masculine and one is the sacred feminine. So the sacred feminine principle is the principle of non-aggression. It simply states, do not cause harm to other sentient beings. In other words, don't do any wrongdoing. Don't violate the rights of other people, their lives, their freedom, or their property. Very simple. Do not initiate force that is undue against your fellow beings. Or in other words, don't conduct violence. Now, the sacred masculine principle has to be wed to that and combined with it. It has to be married to the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression. Okay? The sacred masculine principle is the self-defense principle. When violence is being conducted against you, you maintain the inherent right to use defensive force to counteract that violence that is being done unto you. That's the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. This is not a right that is granted or given to anyone. It is a right that exists in nature. It is a birthright. You are born with it. It can never be taken away from you no matter who claims such. 
Okay? So these two principles are critical to understand in harmony with each other, wed to each other in, un in union. Okay? The, the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression with the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. That's what real spiritual enlightenment is about. So to keep, so we, we've looked at what a right is, okay? So we've looked at what arms are. Now let's, what did they mean by to keep? Well, very simple, dictionary definition. Just keep going back to the basic meaning of words, folks. It was common sense. There wasn't anything magical or mystical in the Second Amendment. These were common sense men writing in common sense terms. To, to keep means to have, to own, or to retain possession of. Okay? Uh, you know, a third grader knows this. Right? To own something means that regarding that thing, an individual maintains rightful possession, meaning you didn't steal it from someone else, control over its usage, meaning you get to decide what is done with it, and responsibility for its usage, which I would argue is the key thing in this definition of what it means to own something. So, I own my body. I'm in rightful possession of it, I control what happens with it, and I'm responsible for it. If you own an object, then you have to have these three things, three things lined up and in, in harmony with each other. Rightful possession, you control over its usage, and responsibility for its usage. So, I am a firearms owner, I have rightful possession of the arms that I keep, I control their usage, I am the one who uses them responsibly, and I am responsible for their usage. What happens with that gun is my responsibility because I own it. So, and it's the same thing with any possession, a car, a house, your own body. Okay, Rightful possession, control over its usage, and responsibility for its usage are the hallmarks of true ownership. Speaking of the possession of arms, James Berg, author of uh, a book called The Ideological Origins of the Second Amendment, wrote, the possession of arms is the distinction between a free man and a slave, it being the ultimate means by which freedom was to be preserved. Unarmed people are enslaved people, ladies and gentlemen. Free people have the means to defend their freedom. Period. Anyone who is disarmed is made into a slave. That's how you should read that. In natural law, there is equality of rights, as opposed to in man's law, where some people have rights that other people don't have magically. I, I'd love for people to explain to me how that situation actually works out, because it doesn't exist in nature. Everyone in reality has the same exact rights. No one has any more or less rights than anyone else does. Since rights are not created by humanity because they exist objectively and inherently in nature by way of them being actions in nature, no human being or group of human being, beings is actually capable of, quote, granting rights to anyone else, nor is any human being capable of, quote, unquote, revoking rights from anyone else. These are claims that are made by people who believe that they have such capabilities, that they have such power. But in nature, in reality, that can never be done. Rights can never be granted or revoked. They exist inherently in nature, and they are immutable. They are unchangeable, because they are based in whether an action causes harm or not to another being. And that exists inherently, naturally, in the real world, not as a construct or an idea in someone's mind. To bear simply means to carry. Okay, it does not mean to brandish or to take out and wave around, okay, as some people believe it does. It simply means to carry on your person. So when we understand, if we understand the natural law that no one actually has the right to grant or revoke someone's rights, how can licensure come into the picture? How can one group of people say, we have the right to license if you put a gun on your hip, cover it up with your shirt, and walk out the door? Yet many people will insist that that can be done. I ask, if no individual can grant somebody else that right, how can a group grant somebody else that right? Who, anywhere, can grant or refuse to grant a right which already exists to someone else? That is my question on this slide. And the answer is no one can. The correct answer, regardless of what anyone thinks, the correct answer is that cannot really be done by anyone. It can only be claimed by some and believed in by others. 
shall not be infringed. This is the one people have the hardest time with, especially the revisionists. You know, they, they, they think we could just make laws about this regarding firearms and that's okay. You know, well, if you understand what a, an infringement really is, the dictionary definition of infringement, you'll understand all laws that are made about firearms are completely invalid. Infringement is to limit or to encroach upon something. It means to act so as to limit or undermine, to encroach upon, to chip away at. Okay? So, to encroach. What does encroach mean? It's not really a very common word. I mean, you know, they use it in football, but you don't usually hear this word in modern, you know, uh, uh, colloquial English. So to encroach means to advance gradually beyond the usual or acceptable limits, beyond the usual perception, to do it incrementally, to take a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, until you have it all. That's what an encroachment is. Okay? It's called incrementalism is the name of the game when it comes to these revisionist interpretations of the Second Amendment and of the natural law right to defend yourself with arms. First comes background checks, then comes registration, then comes confiscation, and then we all should know what comes after that. It's called genocide comes after that. Everybody before they leave here should take that chart that I have printed in the back, I printed 50 of them, take a couple, take one for your friends. It's from a group called Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership, one of the best gun rights activist groups in the United States. And there's a chart on there and I actually have it coming up later in the presentation, but there's a chart on there outlining all the regimes in the last 100 years that murdered their citizenry, how many people they murdered, and how they did it as a direct result of gun control measures. You know how many people it was? I'll give you the number a little bit later on in the presentation. This is called incrementalism, okay? And it's a tactic of Fabian socialism or creeping socialism. This shield here is the shield of the Fabian society. And you'll notice they're very open about their stated agenda of bringing outward socialism in through incremental measures. One of their big stated agendas is gun control. Okay? It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You see there? The wolf's head, the wolf's body. But on his body, strapped to him, he has a white sheep's you know, fur around it. And this is their openly stated... <laughs> Shield. That's their open. That's their their symbol. Okay. So, all all laws regarding guns, all laws regarding the ability to keep and carry, to own and carry defensive weaponry, are completely antithetical to to truth and natural law. Okay. And people will say, well, should we have automatic weapons? Should we have this? Should we have that? We should have all means of defensive weaponry at our uh, capabilities and be responsible for that. If, look, the bottom line is if any form of military or police force has a weapon and the people do not, you're already enslaved. That's the bottom line. Once somebody acquires better tactics and capabilities and weaponry, you're already at a tactical disadvantage and it makes it that much easier for your rights to be completely overwhelmed. We have allowed that already to happen. What I'm trying to explain is the mindset that people have to get into to understand how to undo this situation in the United States. The founders told us repeatedly how to do it. We want to think we're so much smarter than these old men. We want to think, oh, that was then and this is now. You know, we would do so well to have people even a quarter as truly wise as these men were. So we have to stop this incremental taking of these rights. Infringement is the road to slavery. Once again, the co-author of the Second Amendment, George Mason, said to disarm the people is the best and most effectual way to enslave them. He understood this. As soon as the government has weapons the people don't have, that's an enslaved society. Thomas Jefferson said the strongest reason for people to retain the right to keep and bear arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny in government. It was not about hunting rights, it was not even about self-defense within your own home, although that comes into the picture, but ultimately the 
ownership of firearms was about defense against tyranny, and anybody that says it wasn't, all you need to do is go right to the, the founders' words themselves. They were all too happy to explain it over and over again, unambiguously what they meant by the right to keep and bear arms. It wasn't about any of these other things. It was about your ability to defend yourself against a standing militarized present in, presence in your midst. That is what it was about. Unambiguously, that's what it was about. And I, I won't let Thomas Jefferson have the last word on that. I'll let Adolf Hitler have the last word on that. Hitler said the most foolish mistake we could possibly make would be to permit the conquered Eastern peoples to have arms. History teaches that all conquerors who have allowed their subject races to carry arms have prepared for their own downfall by doing so. So let's not have any native militia. German troops alone will bear the sole responsibility for the maintenance of law and order. It worked out real well, didn't it? This is what some people here in the United States would like to see. Only government with access to firearms. And go get that chart in the back on your, on your way out of here tonight and you'll find out what happens. Here it is, right here. A little difficult to see with the fine print, but there's the number, folks. Over 90 million civilians have been murdered by governments within the last 100 years, the last century alone, as a direct result of implemented gun control measures. 90 million souls. Almost 300 million individuals in totality when you count in all wars, military combatants plus civilians. 90 million civilians murdered by their own governments, not foreign governments, their own. Okay? This is democide, death by government. And that chart in there, out there on the way out, it has this within it. It's by JPFO. You can check their website out. And, you know, uh, they have a great film out called Innocence Betrayed that I highly recommend everybody watch, too, about what happens when gun control measures are passed. 90 million people in the last 100 years from 1915 to 2015. Reassembly. Put it, let's put it all back together. We've broken down what every word in the Second Amendment literally means. So now let's reassemble it. All right? This is how the Second Amendment was actually written in late 18th century parlance. A well-regulated militia, B, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Some strange comma placement and some strange, um, you know, ordering of wording. Okay, now how we might write it today in modern colloquial English is like this. Since a well-regulated militia of the people is necessary to secure freedom, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Already you can see it's infinitely less ambiguous. But this is what was meant by this. See, they say a well-regulated militia being necessary, meaning since it is necessary. See, they didn't even feel that they had to explain what a militia was because this was an everyday term for them. In their day, everybody knew what the militia was. They knew who constituted it. They knew what it was used for. You know, today, all these revisionists and our absolutely appalling understanding of world history, especially our own, you know, gets in the way of the understanding of this word. You know, the media is all too happy to constantly, you know, berate the entire idea, the concept of a militia, and make it look like they're, they're the bad guys, you know? So... This is how we would write this today. Since a well-regulated militia is necessary to secure our freedom, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, much less ambiguous. I'm going to show you now how I would have written it, if I may be so bold. Here's how I would have written it. And this is the reassembly that I'm talking about. We're putting it all, all the concepts back together. Since it is true that a militia of the people, or in other words, a decentralized distributed force of armed individuals comprised of the body of the people who maintain working weaponry and tactic tactics commensurate to a military force 
is necessary for and essential to the preservation of a free way of life the inherent natural rights of people everywhere to own and carry defensive weaponry of any kind shall never be encroached upon so as to limit or undermine those rights. You think it would have been a lot less ambiguous? I think it would have been a lot less ambiguous. You know, I think we need further clarity of language sometimes which is what I try to bring to bear on some of these issues. There are 27 words worth fighting for, ladies and gentlemen. We have to continue to fight for them, or we're going to be in infinitely worse trouble than we're already in. But they are just words. They are. I have to make that statement. They're words that convey very important ideas, but they are just words. You know, when it really comes down to it, tyrants don't care about truth. Tyrants don't care about truthful ideas or concepts. They most certainly don't care about rights. That's why they're tyrants. They're conquerors. They're enslavers. That's why words are one thing, but being ready is entirely another thing. And I would hope that a presentation like this would help people to understand the true meaning and purpose of those 27 important words. But then I would also hope that it would inspire action. And it would help people to start to put yourself in the psychological mindset of preparedness, of responsibility, of right action. You know, come to think of it, maybe I would have added just four extra words to the Second Amendment right there. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for your kind attention.